Chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome is a disorder that uh, arises from uh, a deletion on the 22nd chromosome, hence the name that we've been given. And it's also been known in the past as velocardiofacial syndrome, earlier than that, de George syndrome. But we tend to use this one label now because it identifies the genetic deletion that is common to most of the uh, manifestations. It's uh, quite a common disorder, although not widely known. It's thought to occur in about 1 in 2,000 live births. Um, and it affects all of the um, ethnicities and occurs across all countries with equal prevalence, as far as we know. It affects multiple organ systems, such as the heart, the immune system, um, the shape of the face and uh, the roof of the mouth, and a range of other um, abnormalities that are seen in medical um, conditions. Um, here at the Mind Institute, we focus on the mind, brain, and behavior aspects of the disorder. Um, and so that is something we've been studying for about a decade and a half. Um, about eight and a half years here at the Mind Institute. And we've also developed a clinic um, to go alongside our research activity so that we can integrate the clinical and the research activities together. Nobody born with this disorder has all of those, ma of those different manifestations. And so there are different um, subtypes in a way. Um, people will get identified through the cardiac uh, defects, which can be quite serious, to some of them quite mild and that will affect whether they are identified by, for example, cardiology early on. Some children will just have feeding problems because of the issues with the roof of the mouth, and they'll be uh, picked up by different subspecialties. Sometimes um, the immune system causes a lot of infections early on, and that may be another way that children are picked up. Other times it will be a geneticist who will look at the, the child and maybe see the facial appearance, and that's uh, one of the ways that children can be detected. And some children are not, are not detected um, until much later on. One of the other characteristics about the disorder is that children have a range of intellectual capabilities. So typically in this population, um, children will uh, show mild intellectual impairment, um, what's often called the borderline impairment. So they're much less affected than, for example, a child with Down syndrome. Um, but because they have mild developmental delay, that can sometimes mean that they're not detected so easily in the school system, and yet they're struggling and having a very hard time learning um, as they go through school. The most common mental health disorders that are diagnosed in children are um, mainly ADHD and anxiety, occurring in about 50 to 60 percent of children um, in, in each case. Um, it has been uh, suggested from several publications that 20 to 50 percent uh, of children have an autism spectrum diagnosis, and um, that's something that we have been questioning and looking into with our research program. People are affected with this disorder mostly in what are called de novo deletions. So this is a rearrangement of the genetic material because of the particular characteristics of that part of the genome. So about 90 percent of cases just happen um, from the first time in the family, they're not inherited. Um, but about 10% of cases are inherited. So if you are a person who has the deletion, then you have a 50% chance of having a child with the same deletion. And so uh, it's not common to see multiple cases within the same family. For about um, 12, 13 years, I've been funded by uh, a grant from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development that's been focused primarily on understanding the mind and brain changes that underlie the developmental delay and the learning difficulties that children with this disorder have. And as the, uh, I moved my research project here to the Mind Institute about eight and a, eight and a half years ago, um, and really the special circumstances of the Mind Institute provided a really unique opportunity for us to integrate clinical care and basic research together. And as we brought our clinicians alongside the basic research program, we began to understand that there were really important interactions between the impairments that the children had and the requirements that the world makes of them on a day-by-day -day or even moment-by-moment -moment basis. We've started to use a term that we've been calling here copers and strugglers. So we've been talking about the fact that we're seeing children who, irrespective of their intellectual development, 
are actually coping very well because their capabilities and the demands that are required of them are very well matched. So despite the fact that they may have intellectual challenges, they have low levels of anxiety and high levels of what we call adaptive functioning, which is really how well you can function and solve problems in the world every day. And they're actually really coping at a level far beyond what would be expected of them given their intellectual capabilities. By contrast, we've seen other children who can sometimes have quite level, high levels of intellectual capability, and yet they are poorly calibrated or poorly matched to what's being required of them. And they seem to have high low levels of anxiety, low levels of adaptive functioning, and we call them the strugglers. And what we think is that um, those children who are struggling for long periods of time may be at increased risk for the more serious psychiatric disorders over time. And this allows us to think specifically about well-validated, clinically available interventions um, that don't require special knowledge of 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome that we can point those families to and that they can get in their local communities uh, in schools or in other places like that. Critical part of our research is to be uh, sure about identifying what the actual impairments are that are causing those presentations that appear to be like that. And we have a number of hypotheses. So they have to do with, for example, the level of language capability that they have, the conceptual development that they have that enables them to understand things like indirect speech or, for example, um, metaphors that people use. Um, one of the famous examples we had in our clinic was that a father came and talked about his child and dropped his child off at school with a friend. And he said to his daughter, um, this will be great. You'll be able to show her the ropes. And as he drove home, he thought, oh, my goodness, she's going to spend the whole day looking for rope. Now, if you can't have an interaction like that, it's going to be rather difficult. So the idea would be that if we can uh, produce sound results in our research pointing to what the actual impairments are, then we would treat those children to improve their functioning in those areas where they're impaired. This will make them socially more capable of interacting with others, reduce their level of anxiety again, and then they will find social interaction more rewarding, more successful, and they will not appear to have we believe, an autism spectrum diagnosis.